This video is sponsored by Redshift 9. and welcome to this episode of Night Sky News for May 2023 with me, astrophysicist Dr. Becky Smethurst. This is the show where we chat about what you can look out for in the night sky in the next few weeks, and we chat about what's been happening in space news in the past few weeks. This month, we're chatting about not one, not two, but three brand new JWST results. And there's chapter markers down here if you want to skip ahead to any specific news story. Plus, any scientific research papers I mentioned are all going to be linked in the video description down below. So without any further ado, let's kick things off and start by looking up. All right, this month it's all about Mars and Venus. They are both really prominent in the evening sky at the minute. Wherever you are in the world, you should be able to see this. And as they move along their orbits throughout the month of May and June, we're gonna get a few little treats along the way. So starting with, on the 23rd and 24th of May, the crescent moon, aka my beloved toenail moon, is going to be right in the middle of Venus and Mars in the west just after sunset. Now the further east you are, you'll see this on the 23rd when the moon is closest to the very bright Venus, you know, it's the brightest things in the sky. And then by the time that night rolls around for those of us further west, the moon is going to be moving more central. Then by the 24th, for those in the east, it will be in the middle. And then for those of us in the west, it's going to be closer to that fainter reddish Mars. It should make picking out Venus and Mars that bit easier as well if you don't know what you're looking for, having the moon there is just a little bit of a signpost. Now if you have a telescope, break that out and try and see if you can see Venus's phase. Just like the moon, we see Venus lit from different angles as it orbits the sun. So right now it appears half lit as it slowly comes round to a point in its orbit that we call its greatest elongation. Essentially it's the furthest separation from the sun that Venus gets in in the sky from our perspective here on Earth. That's going to happen on the 4th of June and what it means for us stargazers here on Earth is that Venus is going to be the highest in the sky that it ever gets and it's going to stick around for longer after the sun has set. So that means that the rest of May and June are the perfect time for trying to spot the very bright and high Venus in the sky. Now, if you want another excuse to break out your telescope or maybe binoculars or even try your hand at some astrophotography, then on the 1st and 2nd of June, Mars is going to have moved into the Beehive Cluster of Stars, also known as M44. It's an open cluster of around about a thousand stars, and I've actually made a video for the Deep Sky Videos channel about the Beehive Cluster if you want to check that out. And through binoculars, the Beehive Cluster looks spectacular. Like it practically glitters. There's so many stars in that area of sky and to have Mars passing through that region as well is just going to be spectacular. Now if it's cloudy on those dates for you, don't worry because you're going to have another chance at this, but this time with Venus on the 12th and 13th of June as it too moves along its orbit and passes through the Beehive Cluster. Again, through binoculars or with a telescope with a very low zoom lens on it, you know, Venus and this sort of backdrop of thousands of stars is just going to look absolutely spectacular. So if you do manage to capture any astrophotography shots of this, send them my way over on social media because you know I would always love to see them. Now, before we chat about what's been happening in space news, the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that all of the visuals in the night sky segment showing you, you know, where to look for the planets or the stars were all from Redshift 9, the sponsor of this week's video. Redshift 9 is a virtual planetarium software that simulates what the sky will look like at any time or location to give you an interactive star chart that has all of the constellations, sure, but also 1.2 million asteroids and 1 million deep sky objects like nebulae and other galaxies. I absolutely love Redshift 9 because there's loads of features in it that I would have to usually go to other places to find. So for example, like showing the path a planet is going to take through the sky in the next few weeks or showing the positions of solar system objects in their orbits in real time or maybe even eclipse paths and maps of totality, which is honestly going to make planning my trip to next year's eclipse that much much easier. Plus, if you have a motorized telescope, you can even use Redshift 9 to control and point your telescope at any given 
object. So if that sounds like something you want to get your hands on, there's a link in the video description down below where you can download Redshift 9 for Windows machines. Plus, if you use the code Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, you're going to get a 30 euro discount. So thank you so much to Redshift 9 for sponsoring this video. And now let's come back down to earth and chat about what's been happening in space news in the past month. All right, well, this month saw the 33rd anniversary of the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope. And to celebrate that incredible, unexpected milestone, because, I mean, the original life expectancy with the Hubble Space Telescope was supposed to be 15 years, and now we've got more than double that, with it expected to keep going at least until the 2030s. So NASA and ESA to celebrate this, you know, 33 years of Hubble have released this image of NGC 1333, a star-forming region of gas in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, 967 light years away. So you can see these newly formed stars burning hottest and brightest, heating up the gas around them and blowing away the dust, which you can still see is very dense in the middle of the image where it's like shrouding like ongoing star formation and the reason that you can pass all of that information is because of the color of the image right and where they get the color from is from images that let through different wavelengths of light through filters so first they take an image only letting through blue wavelengths of light which show off the hotter regions then an image which only lets through green wavelengths and then an image only letting through the red wavelengths which shows the cooler regions of this gas cloud. Plus, then they use a filter to take an image that only lets through specifically the light emitted by hydrogen gas. To get hydrogen gas to glow like that, you need a lot of energy. So you know there's some newly formed stars nearby that are giving off a lot of UV radiation. Now, the final image that you see is created by coloring these filter images appropriately according to their wavelength, you know, red, green, and blue, and then adding them to together to give that final image. It's as close to what you would see if your eyes were as big as the Hubble Space Telescope and that sensitive to light. And the reason we do this is because that color helps us to pass that scientific information that's in all of that data that in black and white you can't pick out very easily of where are the hotter and the cooler regions in the areas that that hydrogen gas is glowing because of very high energy star formation that's going on in those areas. If you're curious about this, I've actually made a video before about the color in space images, so both true color and false color images as well. You know, if you want to know more about this process, I'll pop a link in the video description down below to that video. But it's not just a pretty picture, right? Studying star formation regions like this is incredibly important for our understanding of the life cycle of stars. Plus, the sun and the solar system most likely started life in a region of space just like this one, very dense gas cloud, forming alongside lots of other stars that the sun has since drifted away from. So studying regions like this helps us to better understand the sun and the solar system's beginnings as well. But enough about the Hubble Space Telescope, because this month we have not one, not two, but three new JWST results to talk about. Now, two of them are on exoplanets, so we're going to do those together in a little bit. But first, I want to start with this work from Morishita and the Glass Collaboration, who claim to have found a proto-cluster of galaxies in JWST data. Specifically, in this image of Abel 2744, also known as Pandora's Cluster, which we actually talked about in a Night Sky News just a few months ago. It's a big cluster of galaxies about 4 billion light years away. So, astrophysically speaking, pretty nearby. But the main goal with JWST has always been to find and characterize the most distant galaxies in the universe, the ones where the light has been traveling from those galaxies to us for over 13 billion years years, so that we're seeing those galaxies as they were over 13 billion years ago in the very early days of the universe. We can therefore literally watch the very first stars and galaxies being born so that we can learn how do structures form in the early universe? How do galaxies form and how do they 
evolve. And it's thought that where material in the early universe, so mostly hydrogen gas, where that material was densest, you're going to get the most galaxies forming. And you're also going to get those galaxies forming at a quicker rate as well. So people have always been on the lookout for these over densities in the early universe, a place where you can find more galaxies forming there. And they are the precursors to the big giant galaxy clusters that we see now, but forming in the very early universe. They are proto clusters. Now, back in 2014, Zheng and collaborators were looking for very distant galaxies in Hubble imaging of Abel 2744. And what they were looking for in all of these images that they'd taken at these different filters was a drop off in the light at bluer filters, whereas you'd still detect the galaxy in redder filters. This is because as light from a distant galaxy travels through the universe and it might pass through a cloud of hydrogen gas, the hydrogen absorbs light at a very specific wavelength of light. But since the universe is expanding, light from the distant galaxies also gets redshifted, and as it encounters more and more clouds of hydrogen gas, it continuously loses that same wavelength of light. And you end up with this big drop-off in light at these bluer wavelengths, meaning that you can spot a very distant galaxy in the redder filters, but not in the bluer filters. Hubble can only detect so far into the infrared though, so at some point you actually redshift the light completely past what Hubble can see, which is why you need JWST data. But Zeng and collaborators did find some promising candidates in the background of Pandora's cluster. And usually you'd expect those to be, you know, randomly distributed across the sky, but they found that nine of them are all sort of in the same area, suggesting that they could be in an over density, a proto cluster like what people have been searching for. Now, even if you use JWST to do this, this method of detecting distant galaxies with this sort of dropout in different filters is not very precise. Ideally, what you do is take the light from a distant galaxy, split it through a prism to get that trace of how much light of each wavelength do you receive, so you can much more easily pinpoint that exact drop off in the light. And then you can say, okay, what wavelength does that happen at? Compare it to the wavelength that you know that hydrogen absorbs at, and then you can work out the redshift much more precisely. And with that, you can then work out, okay, this over density I have of lots of galaxies in this region, are those galaxies all at the exact same redshift and therefore at the same distance away from us, and therefore all in sort of the same three-dimensional place in space, rather than being sort of all in the foreground and background of each other and not actually related to each other, kind of like, you know, like stars in a constellation. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope, HST, is not powerful enough to do this. It can't collect enough enough light from a very distant galaxy to have enough to split it into all of its component wavelengths. So instead, this is a job for JWST. And that's exactly what Morishita and collaborators have done here. They finally got some JWST spectra of these distant galaxies using the near spec detector. And you can see that they're looking for that drop off in light to pinpoint the amount that the light has been redshifted by. And you can see the redshift is given by this symbol Z here, and they're all around about 7.88 ish, meaning that the light has been traveling for around about 13.15 billion years before getting to us. And so we're seeing these galaxies as they were when the universe was just 650 million years old, so very early in the universe's history. So it's very likely that these galaxies make up a proto cluster, which has now been dubbed A2744-Z7P9OD, which if it is would mean that it would be the most distant proto cluster ever found, which is a very exciting result in itself. So this research paper just announced the discovery of this proto cluster and also estimated some properties like the total mass of the cluster at 400 billion times the mass of the sun. But the next steps are going to be getting more spectra of the other candidate galaxies that might be in this proto cluster and analyzing those spectra along with these uh, further, you know, trying to answer questions like, um, you know, how heavy are these galaxies? What's their mass? Uh, what are they made? of in terms of like, you know, what's the ratio of hydrogen to other heavier elements? Uh, how many stars are they forming? Do their properties correlate with their environment as well? So if they're, you know, uh, in a denser environment, how does that compare to 
to uh, galaxies in the very early universe that we see that are in a very isolated environment and have been completely left alone. And then can, you know, all of these properties like the masses and the star formation rates, can they be replicated by simulations using our best model of the universe? So lots of questions still around this proto cluster and this sort of early work that's been done with JWST that hopefully will help us answer, you know, a lot of questions we have about how galaxies and structures first formed and then evolved in the early universe. But now something completely different, still with JWST, but this time exoplanets. Firstly, this research by Kempton and collaborators on the planet JG1214b, which might ring some bells for a few of you because I spoke to my colleague Dr. Jake Taylor back in December and he actually teased that this result was coming. We're studying the phase curve of GJ1214b. Hopefully that should be out soon as well. Oh, so you still want to say, but I can't this? say just yet. <laughs> and now that research is finally published, and Jake made sure to send me this paper so I didn't miss it. Now, JG 1214b is one of the most extensively studied exoplanets ever. You've got HST observations, you've got Spitzer observations, you name a telescope, you've probably got observations of JG 1214b. And that's because it was only the second super Earth to ever have its radius and mass measured and found to be smaller than the gas giants, but then not as dense as like the rocky planet. So it's somewhere a sort of a halfway house between Earth and Neptune, maybe a super Earth or sub-Neptune. We don't have anything like that in the solar system. So figuring out what it's like, you know, has always intrigued people. Plus the star that it orbits around, JG1214, which is a red dwarf, you know, smaller, cooler star than the sun, is fairly close by. It's only about 47 light years away. And then the planet, JG1214b, passes in front of its star every one and a half days or so. So in terms of like when you can actually observe this thing passing in front of its star so you can get details about it, it's fairly often it makes observing it a lot easier. So this was always going to be a target for JWST as one of the most extensively studied exoplanets. We need to follow it up, learn what JWST can do in terms of exoplanet studies. But also because one of the big questions around it has always been, you know, what is its atmosphere made of? Is it more similar to Earth's atmosphere or is it very similar to Neptune's atmosphere? Has it managed to hold on to this sort of big gas giant atmosphere? Is that why it's very under dense? So a lot of questions around it, but the annoying thing is that this planet has a very thick haze of sort of heavier materials at the top cloud layer of its atmosphere. And what that means is that it reflects a lot of starlight back off it, you know, sort of all the wavelengths are reflected pretty much evenly. So when we've looked at this before, we've got a pretty much a, a flat spectrum with no information in it because the light's not been able to penetrate the atmosphere to get absorbed by whatever molecules or elements are present there. And then they can actually leave sort of an imprint on the light that we then detect that's passed through that planet's atmosphere. We can't do that here with this planet, at least with the telescopes we've had previously. But JWST has an instrument on board called MIRI that detects longer infrared wavelengths of light that can actually pierce through that haze. The longer wavelengths go around those heavier molecules, absolutely no problems so that you can actually study what the atmosphere is made of. So that's exactly what Kempton and collaborators have used MIRI to do by taking what's known as a phase curve of JG1214b. This is where you observe the exoplanet for its entire orbit, recording the light that's reflected off the planet and from the star itself, you know, just like observing the moon over its orbit around the Earth and seeing the phase change and the amount of reflected light change. Here you see the phase of the planet change and you detect less light when it's nearer to us on its orbit and when it blocks light from its stars, it passes in front of it. Then the light slowly increases as it heads round the back and sort of becomes nearly full phase. And then we see a little drop again as it passes behind the star from our perspective. So here is that exact thing, the phase curve for JG1214b. The black dots are the raw data from JWST. 
The red points are an average of the black dots over sort of five degrees intervals in JG 1214B orbit. And then the black line is the best fit to those red points. So you can see, first of all, that the overall wave shape from that phase change as you get less and more light reflected as the planet goes round its orbit. And you can also see where the planet passes behind and in front of the star and the light dips slightly. From this, you can then isolate what is the effect of the planet on the star's light. And then you can try and model for it to work out what its atmosphere is made of. So first of all, how much light we get from the planet in total throughout its orbit is what's shown here in black, with models of different atmospheres shown by the different colors. Now what you're looking for is to see if any of these actually come close to matching the data. And hopefully what you can see is that the only ones that have a hope of matching it are ones with very thick reflective hazes and ones with high metal content shown by the, the blue and the purple lines here in the bottom panel that have 300 and 3000 times more metals than the sun has. These are an astronomer's metals here. So we're talking about anything heavier than hydrogen. So yeah, helium, but also carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, things like that that go into making more complex molecules, things like water and methane. For context, Neptune has about 100 times more metals than the Sun does, and Jupiter around about four times, A Jupiter is much more hydrogen rich. Whereas JG 1214b seems to be very metal rich rather than necessarily hydrogen rich. You can also break this down by wavelength as well, how much light each wavelength you received. And you can do this for the day side of the planet that's actually getting light from the star, and also the night side of the planet as well that's furthest away from the star. And again, you're looking to see if you can detect signatures of certain molecules. So, so that's what this figure shows here in the black points for the day side of the planet on the left, and then for the night side of the planet on the right. Again, you've got different colored lines showing models of the atmosphere, and it's the haziest, most metal-rich ones in blue and purple that come the closest. But clearly, they're not perfect. These are quite simple models to start with. There's going to be a lot more work needed to refine them, to get more complex models of, of sort of different compositions to try and match the data. What's really cool, though, is this feature here, this drop at around about five to nine microns. It's more obvious on the night side than on the day side. And if you model for the atmosphere, the only way you can recreate that dip is if you have a lot of water, H2O, methane, CH4, and hydrogen cyanide, HCN, all absorbing light at those specific wavelengths. And that's a very exciting result because the mass and the radius of JG 1214 B gives it a density that has led some people to speculate whether JG 1214b is a water world planet, an ocean planet surrounded by a hydrogen-dominated atmosphere. Now, these results do technically support that hypothesis, which again would be nothing like what we have in the solar system. It would raise a lot of questions about how on earth did something like that even form and come to be. So to find out what's next, I once again asked Dr. Jake Taylor to give us a little bit of an insight. Hey Becky, I'm currently in Nice at the observatory, but I wanted to quickly send you a video because uh, we're finally able to talk about the results from GJ 1214b. So what we've done is pretty awesome. It's the first time we've ever measured a phase curve of a planet that's this cold over the spectral range from 5 to 12 microns. So this is the range in which Miri observes. And as a result of this, it's the first time we've ever detected a thermal emission from a planet that's this cold. This means the light from the planet itself. Over this spectral range, we are seeing some spectral features. This could be water, this could be methane, but right now we're not too sure. We think it's water, but these two molecules have very similar shapes. So hopefully we'll be able to get further observations to be able to narrow down what's actually in the atmosphere. Another really interesting thing we found is that this planet is really reflective. It has a really high albedo, and it's the highest albedo we've ever measured for an exoplanet. This means that whatever the clouds are made of, they're made of this particle that reflects light really efficiently. And so more observations will be able to let us know what is causing this. I can't wait to talk to you more about other exoplanet things, Becky. Bye. Thanks again to Jake for sending that along for all of us to enjoy. And don't forget, you can follow Jake on TikTok at 
Astro Jake T. And finally, another JWST exoplanet study, but this time JG486b, which has been observed by Moran and collaborators with Nearspec. Now, this is once again a planet that's orbiting a red dwarf star every one and a half days or so, but this one is much closer in size to the Earth. So its radius is about 1.3 times the Earth's radius, but its mass is about three times the Earth's mass. So it is an incredibly dense planet orbiting very close into its star. Now, planets like this around red dwarf stars, because the star is much cooler than the sun, even though they're orbiting very, very close in, could still have the, you know, sort of Goldilocks temperatures that could support life and liquid water on the surface if they have an atmosphere. And that's the big if, because being so close into the star, they're also bombarded by radiation from that star, which can give energy to the molecules in the atmosphere and allow them essentially to boil off and escape. So a big question for JWST has always been, do these Earth-like planets around red dwarfs that are very easy to study because they come back around on their one and a half day orbit all the time, so you don't have to wait around very long to actually observe them, you know, could planets like this actually have atmospheres and therefore support life? Now, JG486b, it's just that little bit too close to its star, so its temperature is estimated around about 430 degrees Celsius, so just outside of that habitable zone. So you might be wondering, well, why did they pick this one to observe then? But it had other favorable properties that suggested we would get a very strong signal from it with JWST, so that's why it was picked as sort of one of the first candidates to actually look at. So what Moran and collaborators did was take a spectrum with the near spec detector on board JWST. And this is where you split the light to get a trace of how much light there is at each wavelength. First of all, just for starlight. And then you do the same thing as the planet passes in front of its star. And if you take one from the other, you essentially remove all the properties of the star that have imprinted on the light. And instead, you just get left with the effect of the planet's atmosphere on that light. And what you can then do is hunt for the signatures of different molecules, like for example water, H2O, that have absorbed some of the light at very specific wavelengths. That's the idea anyway. This method is called absorption spectroscopy. It's used a lot across many exoplanet studies, but in practice with real data, it's not quite as clear cut. Because here is an absorption spectrum that process that I just described for JG486. B, shown here by the black points. And you can see it is very, very noisy. Again, the different colored lines are the different models of atmospheres of different molecules, such as carbon dioxide in the orange, methane in purple. You've got an atmosphere with Earth's mix of molecules in green. You've got no atmosphere at all in the gray dash line. And then you've got a pure water atmosphere shown by the blue line. Now, if you look at the values given in the brackets there, in the parentheses, sort of in the key on these plots, these are the chi squared values. Chi is just a Greek letter, but essentially it's a number that can tell you how good your fit is. What you do is essentially sum up the difference between your fit and your data points. And so therefore, the bigger the number, the worse your fit is, and the lower the number, the better your fit is. Is. So if you look at those numbers, you can see why the authors concluded that a water-based atmosphere is the best fit here because it has the lowest chi-squared value. That's despite JG486b's scorching temperatures from being so close to its star. Now, of course, this could be water vapor that it's held onto, but that was still just a little bit of a red flag for the authors of this study, that perhaps maybe it's not the planet's atmosphere where you find water that's doing this absorbing, perhaps it's actually something on the surface of the star itself where there's a big collection of water, vapor, again, obviously, that's doing some absorbing, just like with sunspots that we see on the surface of our own sun. And so when they model for this star spot scenario, instead, here shown in the yellow, they find it gives just as good a fit as a water watery planet atmosphere shown in the blue again. So they can't say for certain which scenario is most likely yet. If it did turn out that JG486b did have this water-rich atmosphere, that would be a huge 
deal. Because, yeah, we found water vapor in the atmospheres of gas giant like exoplanets before, but we've never found water vapor, you know, in the atmosphere of a rocky Earth like exoplanet before. And given the fact that, you know, JG486b is so close into its star, just outside the habitable zone with these very high temperatures, and yet has still managed to hold on to a water vapor atmosphere, perhaps, that means that it's much more likely we'll probably find water in the atmospheres of these planets around red dwarfs that actually are in the habitable zone. And that could have huge implications for, you know, where we look for life outside of Earth, you know, out there in the universe, if it was this scenario and not the star spot scenario. The good news is we've got a way to tell the difference because you can see that the two models are very different at the shorter wavelengths that Moran and Carburetors haven't probed here, but that JWST is actually sensitive too. So when you use the detectors on board JWST, you do have to make certain decisions about what observations you want to make. So with near spec, you have to choose the dispersion filter you want to use. And that's the thing that takes the light and actually splits it into its component wavelengths. But these different filters are only sensitive to certain wavelength regions in the spectrum. So Moran and collaborators chose on where there was known absorption features of different molecules that they thought would give them the best bet of characterizing this exoplanet's atmosphere, but it turns out we actually needed probably the lower wavelength range to be able to tell the difference between these two scenarios of a sort of rocky planet with a water atmosphere or just a star with some of these uh, star spots with water vapor in them. So it's very, very likely that JG486b is going to be observed again with JWST, this time probably either with near spec or maybe even with NIRIS, another detector on board that can do this splitting of the light, but this time focusing on these lower wavelengths of light where hopefully we'll get the data that will be able to tell us the difference between whether this is just star spots or whether it's a rocky planet with a water rich atmosphere. All right, that's it for this month's night sky news. As always, if you snap any pictures of the night sky or if you see any astronomy related news stories, you know, on your travels around the internet that you want me to explain in a future video, then send them my way over on social media. But until next time, everybody, happy stargazing. For May 2023, 2020, yeah, that was right. One thing wonder. Likely that this, 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 how on earth did, on earth or <laughs> the universe, a lower wavelength range, rave, something went wrong there. Help us understand, you know, the suns and the solar systems. I think the binman just arrived outside because I just had a very big crash of glass. Hilarious that I'm talking about the glass collaboration as the binman takeaway, the glass recycling. I mean, thank you, binman, for your service, but... I wonder if anyone will notice that I'm not in the comments when this video comes out, because by the time this video comes out, I'm going to be on holiday. <laughs> Sorry. But now it's a real thing. I need a break. But someone in the comments on my last video said that they hated my nails. And I'm just like, I love my nails. They're this cool, like, minty green color. And also, I had this manicure done three weeks ago in Toronto, and they're still perfect. I'm just like, oh, I can't stop looking at them. I'm just like, yeah.